Good morning, friends. It's Sandra. I'm the pastor at Cook Shania Methodist Church. Welcome to our patio. I don't know about you, but today I am very grateful that God funk of this color blue uh, that is filling the sky. I know that um, at least here in Middle Tennessee, we've had a, a bunch of days filled with clouds. Sometimes it's easy to forget that there's such uh, glory uh, in the clouds as well as behind them. But today I'm grateful for this color blue. How about you? Uh, I hope that your day is already filled with the reminder of uh, so many things God is and is doing, has done for you. For that is the source, I think, of a life of gratitude to just be in the moment with the one who loves you best. So good morning to all of you. There's Janet and Edna, and I think I saw Ruth pop by. Um, I was yakking instead of watching your names roll by. And sometimes they uh, all come on the screen about the same time, so I don't get to see them at all. Oh, <sighs> So a couple of updates I would like to um, share with you. I don't know if you saw or not. Uh, some of you are friends with Chad's family, but um, I mentioned Chad Quentin a little earlier in the week, who has finished his uh, competition in weightlifting at the uh, Special Olympic Games, and he's coming home with many medals, silver and gold. And so we are proud of you, Chad, not just for your accomplishments, but for the way that you handle yourself as a man of God. Uh, and we are just so stoked uh, about your success and the way you've handled yourself. So congratulations uh, to the Tennessee weightlifting team. Congratulations to all of you uh, who are competing uh, and growing uh, in and of yourself uh, this week in that special event. Uh, we're continuing to remember friends like Melissa and her family, Grover and his family. So many are in an uh, extremely different place, uh, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, than Chad is, and we are mindful of you too, my friends. So our prayers are with you. Um, we're closing out uh, the week with Ecclesiastes. Um, we're um, a good portion of the way through, and I'm actually going to do something that I haven't done in six months with this endeavor of reading Scripture chronologically. I'm actually going to step a little bit of ahead because of a beautiful passage, um, or actually it's just two verses. I guess that's a passage. Um, uh, there are um, a couple of things I want you to carry into the weekend uh, with you that we wouldn't be able to cover unless we just lag behind next week. So there you are. We're going to uh, move a little bit ahead. Uh, just a, a backtrack for a second. Ecclesiastes is attributed to Solomon. We've already talked um, some about the close of Solomon's um, kingship, the close of his ministry, the uh, lessons of his life, um, that even in his wisdom, he made some really dumb choices, all because of his own definition of love or appetites in life, however you want to see that. But we go from uh, we watch uh, Solomon develop from this person who um, pursued wisdom as God's greatest gift to him, um, knowing that without it he could not do the things that his life held for him by God's design. And, uh, and in that development or deterioration, uh, we move from Proverbs um, and I, um, well, let me finish this thought and then I want to go back and um, simplify some things. So we go from Proverbs, lessons learned that he wants to share with other people, to a kind of jaded uh, philosophical offering that we get in Ecclesiastes. As a matter of fact, 
This is the only book in the canon of scripture. Uh, by canon, I mean authorized, accepted, uh, sanctioned um, as those books that would be included. There were many that were not. Um, and so in the canon of scripture, this is the only book that we find that is philosophical in this way. And it's not this erudite kind of out of reach um, philosophy. It's uh, based on what we Wesleyans really understand, and that is observation and experience. And so what you have seen, um, what you've reflected on, what you've experienced, Wesley, John Wesley, um, was very encouraging of us using our own gifts of reason. Let's don't just uh, stumble across um, uh, obstacles that come our way, but let's learn uh, so that we don't stumble again the next time. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's an African proverb that says, don't look where you fell, look where you slipped. See? So um, Ecclesiastes carries with it this sometimes a sour and bitter element because Solomon is continuing to learn about the power of wisdom in his life. So uh, here's what we're going to do is we're going to walk through 7, 8, 9, and 10, really just hitting the top of the waves. Uh, and then I want to close uh, with a couple of bookend ideas, one from chapter 5 and then one from chapter 11, the very beginnings of those two chapters, uh, as we head into some days of rest and reflection and play that sometimes keeps us from being present in the moment with God. So uh, here we go. Um, we, we begin in that passage, um, in that group of chapters rather from seven, eight, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to go back and say something. Okay, this is my take on Proverbs, the whole book of Proverbs. Um, you know that little tag that's on our hair dryers when we purchase them now? We're not ever supposed to take that tag off. It needs to be a constant reminder that it is not wise for you to dry your hair in the bathtub while you are bathing. Um, yeah, that tag is there because somebody else thought that that might have been a good idea and did not want to be responsible for their own choice, but to make somebody else responsible for that. It's like Proverbs are those hair dryer tags for us. And then Ecclesiastes is the backstory and the whining about how we wish someone had told us, how we wish we had had more information so that I could have made a better choice. So let's learn from Solomon. Admiral Byrd once said, we have to learn from the mistakes of others. We will not live long enough to make them all on our own. Hair the hair dryer tags and so let's learn from Solomon's wisdom uh, but wisdom carries with it this sense of philosophical wondering that won't have an answer until after we've had an experience that's part of the irony I think of wisdom um, and this is where uh, his sourness sometimes comes from he says uh, what seems to be the antithesis or the opposite of what he's just taught us in Proverbs when he says things like this. This is from chapter 7. Sorrow is better than laughter, and a sad face is good for the heart. You just told us uh, that it, a, a cheerful face, a cheerful heart is good medicine, for not just for the one who wears the smile, but for all those around them. Th there seems to be, um, not that Solomon says he's wrong, but he is continuing to learn. And it's all not always that easy. I, I want to go uh, forward to uh, chapter 8 because he seems to have a tender moment when he writes this in the first verse of chapter 8. Who is like the wise man? Who knows the explanation of things? Before I finish that verse, 
I want to remind you there is a difference between knowledge as information and knowledge as transformation. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm hoping that you have all discovered by now that um, studying scripture is a lifelong, maybe even an eternal practice because we never learn all the information and we can we continually are changed and shaped because of new understandings and new experiences as we read the stories of those who have gone before us and understand our stories better it is still a bit of hindsight that leads to understanding and wisdom and so who is like this one who is being transformed by the experience of God Almighty? Uh, what is it that the wise man or woman understands now that she or he didn't understand yesterday or before that dark valley or before that diagnosis or before that heartache? Wisdom, he continues, brightens a man's face and changes its hard appearance. Um, I'm, I, I'm still kind of coming to terms with what it feels like to be uh, my age. I've never been this age before. Now, what I envisioned uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, even physically is not what I see in the mirror. I, I couldn't have anticipated the experiences that I've had, living longer than my dad, uh, watching my husband live through uh, brain surgery. Uh, and go on to um, a much deeper career than he could have ever fathomed. Uh, loving my sister as a, an adult uh, friend with whom I am partnering to care for our mother as a friend. Um, there, there's so many things I couldn't have anticipated 30 years ago. And so I think when we are present in those experiences, every day, mundane, some dramatic, some not so much, when we are present in those moments, wisdom, understanding, information, transformation comes to us in a way that makes us generous with our understanding, generous in mercy and in love. It softens not just our um, face as if we know right and wrong and we are going to govern our lives and maybe somebody else's <laughs> that way. It softens us and makes us patient and understanding in ways that lead to even greater wisdom. That's why it's easy and not so much judgmental when we hear Solomon say things like he did in the 10th chapter. These lessons are there, check them out. You can't fix stupid. Stupid is gonna reveal itself no matter where you go. Now it's not your place to call somebody else stupid or to point out their stupidity. Scripture seems to say they're doing a fine job on their own. But you, you, you can't fix stupid. Stupid has to fix stupid. And we can be wise if we'll make the choice. The Peter principle is going to happen. There are going to be people who are flopped up to greater and greater expectations or responsibilities until they are no longer competent to fulfill that. And because that's been the practice before, it will still happen even though they can't handle it. The Peter principle happens. Check out chapter 10, verses 5, 6, and 7. That's exactly what Solomon says. There are people who are kings who have no business being kings, and those who are wise are um, not in the place of being a king. 
Um, and there's risk and danger in all things. He says this in chapter 10, verses 8 and 9. Uh, the person who's going to dig a pit, you might fall in. Those who are going to quarry rocks, you might get hurt by one of those. We, we don't know what's on the other side of this experience. We don't know the full impact of what we're doing. There is risk and danger in living in a broken world and on this side of glory. I want to remind you though, that with the power of God within us, when we yield ourselves to the presence of the Holy Spirit, who God intends would live within us, we become the temple of God, God resides in us. When that power is allowed to live there, then we find uh, the risk and the opportunity and with skill and grace that comes from God, nothing is impossible. There is this um, maybe a softening that we can find in, in Solomon, though he's heard very difficult news. Yeah, you've worked hard for this kingdom, um, but you, you're, it's not going to be yours after you're gone. Okay, well, note to Solomon and note to self. What we have built in this life <clears throat> is no longer ours when we're gone either. It's not because God's going to take it away because we've moved on to other things. And Solomon, where he, we find him stuck often, as we read in Ecclesiastes, is he still is thinking about life as centered in this earth. My friends, we live uh, by the power that comes to us through faith in the one who defeated death. We know something about eternity that Solomon didn't know and we are living into a hope that is greater than the one who had great smarts a big bank account two things I want to offer us before we uh, head into the rest of this Thursday and into the close of this week and the beginning of a new one a couple of things beginning with uh, chapter five, verse one, guard your steps to the house of God. <clears throat> uh, in Old Testament uh, writing, your steps often were not just this footstep, then the next footstep, but a reference to your way. Guard your way to the house of God. You go to listen first. Well, going determined to listen first is an automatic place of humility because to listen first is to be aware that you don't know it all. So when we go to hear the word of God. We go to hear someone else's praise. We go to hear someone else, not the praise of someone else, but the praise of someone who is living presently with God. Then we are even more moved. We grow in our knowledge and in our wisdom, in an understanding of our experience. If we go not ready to offer the sacrifice of fools, fool, stupid, that's the connection there. We, when you go thinking you already know what's to be done, how to do it, and you run headlong, you may, into a moment, you may miss something new that you've never discovered of God before. Guard your steps, my friends. May all of us guard our steps as we gather to the place where God is. Oh my gosh, I have to, I'm sorry. I know I'm so distractible, but a truck, you heard that truck just go by. I see one goldfinch sitting on the top of a, a gathering of calla lilies here. And when that truck went by, I know there were no less than a dozen of them 
so beautiful and now up in that cedar tree and you can't really see them i wish i could thank you god <clears throat> sorry for being so distracted um but what beauty i might have to find another place to sit because these goldfinches are getting me when we guard our steps though y'all when we mind our heart and our mind when we put ourselves in a place of humility going to the place where we know where god lives and and that God will meet us there. It is the proper place for us to go in a receptive way to open our hearts and our minds and to listen. Guard your steps on the way to God's house. And finally, in response to having guarded our steps, been humble and open at the same time, then this one who is hardened and jaded says to us in chapter 11 verses 1 and part of 2 cast your bread upon the waters for after many days you will find it again give portions to seven yes to eight for you do not know what disaster may come upon the land now he mentions disaster that sounds like he's thinking negatively but let's think about what in the world it means to cast our bread upon the water. Um, I'm automatically thinking of that parable that Jesus told. Uh, you can call it the parable of the sower or the parable of the seeds, but it's about a farmer who threw seed in places that he, if he was thinking would know it doesn't stand a chance to grow up among the rocks, in the thorns, on the path where the birds, like those goldfinches, could get to it quicker than it could ever take root. Cast your bread upon the water and in many days it'll come back. There is goodness in you, my friends, by God's design and by the deposit of gifts and graces and experience that leads to wisdom. And we have been challenged by the one who knows disappointment in the same measure that he knows wisdom, saying, be generous. Seed, the seed of that bread is grain. Cast your grain upon the water. Yeah, like what's, what's that gonna do? The promise, he says, is that it will come back to us. It may take a long time for it to come back, but when you and I are generous, not just with our resources, but generous with the seeds of love and mercy and grace, the seeds of compassion and companionship, the seeds of understanding and solidarity, the seeds of hope, it will come back and it will come back generously, abundantly. So as you think about how it is that God has been generous with you, guard your steps in and out of our places and times of worship and learning. Shoot, guard your steps every day of your life. Every moment is a schoolroom moment and be generous in your response anyway. Yes, I know Solomon was disappointed and he got jaded. You and I do the same thing. We're disappointed in each other. We're disappointed in ourselves. We're even disappointed in God and too afraid to tell him. May we be generous because we have learned that God is faithful, that God is love, that God is always present, which means God is always true to his truth. And may you know the reality of all those things, even in this one moment. Guard your steps and give of yourself the goodness that God has embedded in you, the truth that you are learning, the hope that comes from perseverance. May God bless you in all of your life. Lord, I am so grateful for 
the color of the skies today and for the joyfulness that I experience watching the clouds dance by. I delight in the song of these beautiful birds and how intricately you have painted each one, whether they're ever seen by a discerning eye or not, they are your delight too. Help us to understand that you delight in us as well. In, in the way that you have shaped us and created us, in the ways that we continue to grow because we surrender ourselves to you, in the way that our lives reflect and depict uh, the beauty, the glory of mercy and grace, how we inspire hope because we hang on to hope that comes only by knowing your Son, our Savior. Help us learn how to guard our steps, not just so that we'll step in the right place or the right way, but help us to guard our steps knowing that how we move through this life matters to you, to us, to all of those who journey with us. Oh, and give us the courage we need to cast our bread upon the waters, allowing you to do with these gifts what only you, O oh God, can do. Transform, redeem, grow, and love. And we pray in love's name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. My friends, it's been so good to be with you. I appreciate again your patience and your tolerance of my distractedness. I hope that you are inspired uh, to sing your own beautiful song somehow today. Uh, those are finches that are singing to you right now. Maybe one day you'll get to see them. Love you all. Bye.